<laughs> You've already heard my spiel, so I'm not going to say too much. Um, we've got uh, Josh Lejuni coming next Sunday. He's uh, was over 400 pounds. He's lost 220 pounds, and he's a marathon runner now. So he's got a really, he's a really uh, great person, down to earth and, and funny. So he's going to be here next Sunday. Um, we still have a few tickets for our Italian night that we hold the last Wednesday of every month. Um, so if you haven't tried that before, that's that's a lot of fun. And um, we continue to do the Kickstart program every month. Um, we've had close to 1,000 people go through that now, which is pretty exciting. Um, one of our Kickstarters this month um, started at 420 pounds, and in the first week, he lost 20 pounds. Wow. So it really works. It's, um, it's very cool. I mean, it's almost a miracle for us to see these things happen uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Green Fear was just awarded something called uh, the Good Food 100 Awards. It's a James Beard sponsored um, award for restaurants that do um, uh, great food. So they look at things, organic and sustainable practices. But um, out of 1,600 applicants, we were the only restaurant in Virginia to win one of these one out of 100, um, 100 awards for the, um, for the country. So we're thrilled about that. And so I'm uh, thrilled today to bring um, Chuck Carroll from the exam room. He does his um, million follower podcast, I think, on, um, is it uh, just exam room? Yeah, exam room by the physicians. By uh, PCRO. So if you haven't listened to that, subscribe to that. He's got all kinds of interesting people on there. Including um, you. I, I was on there <laughs> once. He did, did one for me. He, um, Chuck's agreed to be at our uh, Veg Fest 2020, which is going to be April 19th, um, this, this 2020. Yeah. Um, so we're excited about that. And then I'm thrilled to have uh, Dr. Jim Lewis here, good friend and director of the Bernard Medical Center uh, from St. Louis, where he took the uh, two teams to the World Series and the Super Bowl, and uh, now is a uh, a marathon uh, Ironman uh, himself, and so um, please give a welcome to Chuck in. To do this, man. Uh, before we get going, Game Changers is doing just remarkably well, isn't it? Oh, it's it's uh, it's astounding, really. Um, when, when I found out that in like six days, it was the fastest or the highest selling documentary that iTunes had ever had, and shortly thereafter. The top selling uh, independent film. Um, and now on Netflix as of uh, the 16th. Oh, that is the power of plants, my friend. You are correct. <laughs> Has everybody yeah. seen Game Changers here? Yeah. yeah? yeah. Great film. Yeah. Clap it up. Clap it up. Okay, well, if you'll indulge us for a little while as you enjoy your wonderful tasty dinner, we're going to talk a little bit about athletes and nutrition, a little bit more about the film. Obviously, Dr. Lomas was in there, and he has the background, as Glenn mentioned, with the St. Louis Cardinals and the Rams. While they were still in St. Louis, you didn't follow them to L.A. I hear L.A. is wonderful while Washington winters are so cold. So, all right. Well, we're going to get going. You ready? I'm ready. All right, here we go. In three, two, one. Welcome to a very special on-location edition of the Examiner Podcast, brought to you by the Physicians Committee with the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. I am so thrilled to be once again sitting next to the man, the myth, the legend from Game Changers, and he's the director of the Barnard Medical Center, Dr. Jim Loomis. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Chuck. Always a pleasure. Nice ovation from the crowd here at Green Fair. What a wonderful restaurant this is out here in uh, Reston, Virginia, just about a stone's throw away from Dulles Airport. If you're ever in the Washington area, you're listening to this and you're not in the D.C. area, I highly recommend flying into Dulles and on your way into the city, stop in Reston, stop at Green Fair. Gwen and Pericles and the crew here will get you set up with some of the most delicious whole food, plant-based meals that you have ever eaten in your entire life. That is it's amazing food. Salt-free, sugar-free, oil-free, it, it will cure what ails you. Everything the body needs to be the ideal athlete, correct? That is correct. And that is what we're talking about today. The Game Changers film recently released on iTunes, now streaming worldwide on Netflix. This is super exciting because, as I understand it, Dr. Lewis, this film is just burning up the charts. Yeah, it's... Uh, it, 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 Chuck, it's really pretty remarkable. Um, I'm on a number of uh, like marathon Facebook groups, for example, um, and, and you're seeing people pop, questions popping up 
about game changers in these is it really is a phenomenal film a really documentary out there i think that this is the next what the hell and it, who still works there he hit me up and he was like pro science shell at a sports talk station you know you will put together something <laughs> special yeah that's great to hear so here it is sunday and you have a background obviously as a physician formerly in the nfl and major league baseball and a few other places but let's focus on the athletics here it's Sunday. There are NFL games being played across the country. My first question to you is, how are these guys going to be feeling in the morning? <laughs> well, fo football is a uh, brutal sport. And uh, I think that Derek Morgan in the film says the injury rate in the NFL is 100%. And uh, it, it is true. Uh, it, it is such a brutal sport. It, 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 even if it's not a you know, more significant injury like you know, tearing your ACL, um, these guys just get beat up every single Sunday. And, you know, the cumulative effect over the season is, you know, by the by week, you know, 10, week 11, I mean, you know, there's a line to get in the ice bath, and, and then it's uh, it's pretty brutal. Yeah, I've, I've covered professional football for a number of years, and I've told you previously on this show, having the opportunity to interview a player who was plant-based, he was here in Washington for a while, a gentleman by the name of DJ Swearinger, and this was late in the season. You're talking about a line for an ice bath. This is like there's one week to go in the year, and these guys can barely shuffle their feet. And yet here's DJ just bounding down the stairs with all of this energy, skipping toward the table to do this interview, and proudly demonstrates his amazing smoothie station that they had installed for him out there at the training facility, and he's like, dude, it's the plants. Yeah, and you know, that's that's what you hear. I mean, every athlete, you, you know, again, when you take a look at the Tennessee Titans, um, you know, at first when Derek went plant-based, uh, you know, his teammates were making fun of him. Yep. And, and, you know, all of a sudden, halfway through the season, he's not in the training room all the time. He's able to hit the weights on, you know, on the off days and, and train harder. He's recovering faster. His performance on the field is, is, is escalated. And, and all of a sudden, these same guys that are, you know, making fun of him are coming up to him and say, hey, now, what is it you're doing again? And, and um, it's, it's very interesting. At the LA uh, Red Carpet Premier of Game Changers, I had the opportunity to talk to Chris Paul, who's an uh, uh, NBA uh, all-star. Yes. Yeah, now at, uh, at, with Oklahoma, I believe. And he's, I think, 35, and um, he's had some injury issues in the past. And he took, he's fairly recently had gone plant-based, and he told me probably the most amazing statement I've heard from an athlete. He said that he didn't want to tell his teammates or the other players in the league he had gone plant-based, not because he was concerned they'd make fun of him, which is what it would have been a few years ago. It was because he felt like he got such a competitive advantage, he didn't want to give away the secret. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, and you think about that, wow, right? Yeah. I mean, wow. And it's just, it was just, it's just food. Right, right. Thirty-five. I mean, that's that's old for professional athlete standards. You think of Chris Paul, but then you think in the NFL. You look at Tom Brady up in New right. England. Yeah. Forty-two. Yeah, right. Forty-two. The guy is still winning Super Bowls. It's amazing. Right. It's amazing. I uh, just had an opportunity to be in a game, cover that one a, a few weeks ago when he was here in town, and he comes walking into the media room afterward, and he does not look forty-two years old. This guy looks like he's thirty-two, maybe even thirty-one. It's unbelievable. Right. Let's let's get a little bit nerdy, shall we? Let's sure. dive into the science of why Tom Brady looks young, why Chris Paul wanted that competitive advantage, why you were able to do an Ironman triathlon, my friend. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a lot that goes into this, but I think, first of all, we need to understand what happens to the body when you're eating that standard American diet. A word that gets tossed around an awful lot is inflammation. Right. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, so, you know, I think that there's, there's really two, two advantages um, to, to a plant-based diet as far as athletic performance goes. So one is um, it really does create, it, it really does present the optimum fuel um, for an athlete. Um, there's a misperception, when, you know, protein is what makes us, you know, drives our athletic performance. But in fact, it's carbohydrate in the form of glycogen. That's what we use to fuel our exercise. Uh, exercise up to a couple of hours, um, maybe, maybe two and a half hours, more intense exercise. That's all carbohydrate. And um, inherently, a, a whole food plant-based diet is about 75% uh, unprocessed carbs. And, you know, carbs have gotten a bad rap these days. Um, yeah, they have. You know, and, and, and I think that's just a symptom of the fact we've stopped talking about food. Uh, we talk about what food's made out of. 
you know, 30 years ago, we were worshiping carbs, kind of the era of Snackwell's cookies, right? You remember that? You know, it was like free food, right? Now you can eat a whole package because, hey, it's, it's, it's fat-free, right? And if you look at the obesity epidemic we see in this country, it, it starts to, you know, that's about when it starts to creep up. And carbs aren't the problem. It's the package that carbs come in, right? When you think the difference between an apple, say, and, that, and apple juice, right? Right. Um, our bodies have to do work to digest the apple, extract the energy, and all this good. So, um, and when we, when we under-consume carbs as an athlete, um, you can become chronically glycogen depleted, and that can lead to fatigue, and, and you know, if you're a runner, you, you know, you, you've heard of a marathoners hitting the wall. That, that's because you actually run out of glycogen. Um, that's what triggers it. So, um, so the, the macronutrient ratios in a plant-based diet are exactly what you need to perform. And, and in fact, we, we can talk a little bit more about, you know, if you look at it through a, the, the lens of our kind of evolutionary biology, um, which we can talk about in a minute, um, it does really replicate what's felt to be the ancestral diets. But the other huge benefit, and across the board, and my own personal experience as well, it, it, it's the ability to enhance recovery. And, and that primarily has to do with the fact that the diet is so highly anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And we get inflammation from two sources. So one is um, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids in our body. The omega-6 is create inflammation, omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. Um, it's felt the optimum ratio is probably three to one, omega-6 to omega-3. Standard American diet, it can be 50 to one. So you know we've got this low-burning fire in our bodies all the time, exercise is an inflammatory event. So now, you go play a football game, you go run a marathon, you're just throwing gas on the fire, right? right. So no wonder that people can't walk the next day. Okay. And when we, uh, on the other hand, when we eat a whole food plant-based diet, where, where that omega-3, omega-6 ratio is back down to that, you know, uh, what's felt to be the optimum range, well now, we've got water to put on the fire uh, when we exercise. And then the other part of it is oxidative stress. We burn oxygen for fuel. That creates oxygen free radicals. In small doses, they play an important role in cell signaling. You know, when we start to exercise, for example, we, we, we uh, burn more oxygen. So oxidative stress goes up. That sends a signal to our muscles. Hey, I'm getting ready to damage you. So fix me when I'm done. But in excess uh, amounts, it, it actually is felt to be the cause of the delayed onset muscle soreness, the stiffness that you see after a hard athletic event. And, 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 and if that's sustained, it can actually increase your risk for um, uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, the, oxid the, the lipid particles can become oxidized, which make them more reactive with the blood vessel wall. Um, it, they, it's been shown to damage DNA, and it can lead to cataracts, and diabetes, and cancer, and on and on and on. And again, the only place we can get, we can mitigate, we, we can get antioxidants to help mitigate the atherosclerosis is, is, is through our diet, and, and they only occur in plants. So we're talking about a couple of things stood out to me there. Uh, you said that diabetes was one that stood out to me and coronary heart disease. And here's where I'm going with this. Because now I'm thinking about, well, what is it that these players are eating before kickoff? What is the pregame meal? I mean, you were a team physician for a while. What, what fuel are they putting in their bodies before the game right now? So, you know, you go to the pregame to the pregame meal in football. You know, it's typically about 8 o'clock in the morning, somewhere in there for a noon game. And there would be a spread. Um, they would have uh, steak and chicken breasts and pasta, right? You gotta get some carbs for sure. you have to get your protein, right? Um, but even day to day, you know, you go to the training room, there's there's big blenders all around the, the, the weight room with weight protein and such as that. Um, and, and because there's this mythology again around around protein and strength and meat and on and on. And it, it, it was shown in the movie Game Changers, um, when we eat those high fat meals, it you know the, the scene with the blood that was clouded. Yeah, um, that fat impairs our performance because you, you can imagine that, that blood flow is much more sluggish when it's full of that fat, um, and it impairs our ability to recover. You know, on and on and on. So, and, and you know, really, the amazing thing is that there's no one diet to prevent breast cancer. And there's not another diet to prevent diabetes, and another diet to perform optimally, and another diet because you're compassionate about animals, and another diet because you care about the environment. That's really the beauty of a whole food plant-based diet. Because, in fact, it, if you follow a whole food plant-based diet, 
it has been shown to reverse preventive disease and, and prevent diabetes and, and may reduce her risk or prevent certain cancers and it's good for the environment and it's good for the animals and by the way it's good for athletic performance so that's really the beauty of the whole thing really it's the simplicity of it it's not easy for people that are transitioning necessarily but it's certainly easy it's it's a simple it's such a simple concept Definitely a cover all. I think that that's the term that you yeah. know, that's a football term, by the yes. way. Defense. Um, so, question for you. So, that's what players are eating now, by and large. And and those those pregame meals, I'm sure, are very similar today to what they were when you were still with the Rams. Uh, that's very different from what our ancestors used to eat back in the day. Our ancestral diet was quite different, wasn't it? Yeah, so that's interesting. When, when I tried to understand this, when I, I transitioned to a plant based diet in 2011, and I had really profound personal health uh, uh, improvements. I lost about uh, about 70 pounds total, but a lot of that was toward the end uh, with the Ironman training this, this, last, uh, uh, this last year. I lost about 10 or 15 of that. But, you know, I dropped my cholesterol 100 points. I uh, uh, reversed that I had sleep apnea and atrial fibrillation and, and uh, exercise-induced asthma, all of which went away. And you were a doctor. I was a doctor. Yeah, yes. okay. Uh, and um, so, as I tried to try to really understand why just that simple change in my lifestyle had such a profound effect, I, I did a ton of reading. And, you know, and, and what struck me is, is that, you know, we are, um, we're all designed to be athletes. You know, if you think about what it, what we had to do to survive, you know, like any living creature, all of our behavior, our nutritional needs, our, our metabolism evolved to help us accomplish the singular task of trying to hang around long enough and find a mate and pass on our DNA. And historically, to do that, we had to be able to do two things. We had to be able to go find food when we're starving and not be someone else's food when they're starving. And that's where our stress came from, right? And we had to react to that stress through physical activity. So we evolved a stress response. Adrenaline gets us ready to exercise and cortisol helps us recover. And as soon as we survive, that's when we rest, recover, and refuel. And we refuel with what we can find around us on a given day. And this concept that our ancestors were hunter-gatherers is wrong. Um, in temperate climates, there's clear evidence that our ancestors were not hunter-gatherers. We were gatherer hunters. But what did we gather? We gathered primarily whole food, unprocessed, plant-based sources of energy, right? Roots and stems and leaves and seeds and fruits and nuts and vegetables and berries and legumes. I mean, there was no white flower tree or canola oil bush or Dr. Pepper nut, right? Um, we're not designed to use dairy products, except our mother's milk. Right. You know, dairy is a biological fluid that takes baby mammals and turns them into big mammals. And once the mammal's big enough to find food on its own, we don't need our mother's milk anymore. Um, you know, we did eat meat historically. It just wasn't very much. But the meat we ate came from wild animals, not animal stuff full of corn and antibiotics and hormones, which really profoundly changes the nutritional value of, of, of the food. You know, a, a, a corn-finished cow, the omega-3 content of the meat goes down to zero within a week. Right. And it's all omega-6, highly inflammatory. Now, I think you are, I'm not advocating for grass-fed beef, because I think that our ancestors probably did have a survival advantage to having that concentrated animal fat protein to get big and strong and get away from the leopard before they died of infectious disease when they were 30. Right. So they never had to worry about if I eat too much red meat, am I gonna get cancer or diabetes? Because they're already dead. And so through sanitation and antibiotics, we've tripled our lifespan. And so we have unmasked all these chronic problems, all of which are associated with the overconsumption of animal fat, animal protein, you know, et cetera. And then you, you know, you take one step further back and think about the environmental consequences of how we raise animals and how we treat animals. I think you can make a very, very strong argument if you're not starved for calories, that a whole food plant-based diet is, is the optimum diet for human health, planetary health, et cetera. And so if you look at the components of a, you know kind of what an ancestral diet looked like very high in fiber average american today gets 15 20 grams of fiber a day and we're probably designed to get north of 75 75 shown to, to it's like a miracle drug it reverses its pressure and cholesterol and prevents cancer and you know, controls weight and on and on and on it was very low in fat and especially saturated fat um, because the, the wild animals we ate were wild animals. Um, it was very high in antioxidants. Right. It was very, very much anti-inflammatory because it had a very low omega-6, omega-3 ratio. It was very low in salt and very high in potassium. And so that's why it's a both that, that ratio of potassium to sodium has been shown to lower blood pressure. So 
you know, and again, if you, and if you think about what, if you think about that diet, that's exactly the optimal diet for athletic performance. It's the same thing. So, and again, it's this idea, we are all designed to be athletes, right? You, you carry the groceries in from the car, you're being an athlete. You carry the laundry up from the basement, you're being an athlete. You, you give your kid a piggyback ride, you're being an athlete. Now, some people are more athletic than others. Oh, dude, I do a lot of chores, man. I got gold medals. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but to meet your needs, it's just calories that you have to worry about. It's not, that's, that's the, the, now, there might be some very nuanced, if you're a bodybuilder cutting for a, 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 a show or you know, you're running an Ironman, you want a carb load or something like that. There's some very nuanced uh, dietary changes, you can, manipulations you can make. But, but for 99% of the people, people, there's no such thing as, a, as sports nutrition. It's just a healthy, whole food, plant-based diet, and, and it's just the number of calories you consume is all we need to focus on. Well, uh, let's go back to the kind of the ancestral diet and then look at where we are today, because that is a dramatic shift. Uh, how do we get from there to where we are today? Right, there's been profound changes in the Western diet in the last 50, 75 years. Um, sugar consumption, right? Um, on average, we've seen a decline in table sugar consumption, sucrose. That's been more than per capita, we eat 100 pounds of sugar per person. So what that means is on January 1st, you got a family of four, you're bringing four 100 pound bags of sugar and, and each week you scoop out two pounds for everyone in the house. And, you, and people will say, well, well, I don't do that in my house, but we do do it. Because we have, maybe not the people here in this audience, but, but in general we do because we've hidden the sugar in everything, right? It's in, it's in cereal, it's in, it's in tomato, it's in ketchup, it's in bread, it's in sports drinks, I mean, on and on and on and on and on. Um, you know, milk consumption. Again, we're not designed to use dairy. Um, we have seen a decline in whole milk consumption, but uh, especially full, full fat milk. But when we take the fat out of the milk, we're even make cheese out of it. Um, that the cheese consumption skyrocketed, uh, about 45 pounds per capita, per pounds per person per year. That's a lot. Uh, of cheese. It is a lot of cheese, and the problem is because of the way we make cheese today, uh, you know, that exposes us to hormones and antibiotics and antibiotic resistant bacteria and, and all kinds of nasty things. Uh, we eat about 150 pounds of meat a year, um, and again, but the meat we eat today it bears no resemblance to, to, to the, to the uh, uh, meat that we, we were designed to eat evolutionarily. And, and what's interesting is there was a study that came out in, uh, I think, cell metabolism a couple years ago that showed that uh, people who overconsume animal protein, most people overconsume protein in general, right. in particular animal protein, they have a four times greater risk of dying from cancer, right? The smoker has a two times greater risk. So it's actually more detrimental to your health to overconsume animal protein than it is to smoke cigarettes. Holy God. Um, and and um, there's a lot of theories as to why. It probably has to do with overstimulation of insulin growth like factor one, especially found in high concentrations in dairy, you know, on and on. Um, and, and then lastly, um, we've seen a huge increase in edible oils. Um, you know, there has been a fairly significant decrease in uh, animal um, oils, like the lard. I remember growing up, I grew up in the South, and we had a coffee can on the stove where you would put all the bacon grease. Yes, sir. And you would use that to fry the eggs and put in the greens and everything, and everything right? Yeah, you know, in the big cereal. No, that's right. And there was a big, you know, a big tub of lard that my grandmother would make biscuits with and all that. So th that, that consumption has gone down, but it's been more than offset by increased consumption of vegetable oils. And, and that's why I think it's important, uh, and why I, with patients, make a clear distinction between a plant-based diet and a vegan diet. Um, veganism comes historically from an ethical place, right? And it's a good thing. You know, it's about not using animal products, tested on animals, not wearing products made from animals. However, there's a lot of really unhealthy stuff that's that's vegan. That's you know, like it, it's uh, like oils, for yeah. example. Yeah. Um, and one reason, so we talked earlier about the omega-6, omega-3 ratios. Corn oil has an 83 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Right? That's probably one of the most highly inflammatory oils that are out there. 
But what do we feed cows? They mix they mix corn all in with the feed to fatten the cows. And so that's where the inflammation comes from in, in industrially raised animals today. I mean, even olive oil is, um, I think, uh, 16 to 3 or 13 to 3, something like that. Higher than that 5 to 1 right, ratio right. that we, we need. We're looking for a 3 to 1. So, um, and, and again, I think the other issue besides the changes in diet I alluded to earlier is this idea, you know, we, we've stopped talking about food. We don't know what food is anymore. We don't know where our food comes from. We don't know the dirt we grow the food in. We don't know what we put in the dirt. We don't know how we process it after we harvest it. We don't know why we crave it. And we don't know what it does to our bodies after. Right. I mean, we've learned as a society that McDonald's tastes good. McDonald's is cheap. McDonald's is convenient. i got to get the kids to soccer practice, so I'm just going to go to McDonald's. I'll never stop and think that I even, that, that, that I feed myself or my kids food or not. And Michael Pollan, the food writer, would argue, no, those are edible food-like substances. Because if you really thought about it, when you went through the drive to the McDonald's, what you would be ordering would be is colon cancer with large fries and a double bypass with cheese and diabetes with a large soda. I mean, seriously, but that's not how we think about food. And then, you know, then we talked a little bit about the nutritional reductionism early, you know, that we, 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 now we talk about what food's made out of. We talk about carbs and protein and fat. And carbs are not the problem. And protein is, you know, not something magic. It's right. not a magic pill. It's part of when we and when we shift the dialogue back to food, then we don't have to worry about it. Protein you mentioned that a number of times just now, and I think that particularly with athletes, which we're talking about today, it's well, are you getting enough protein? Is it even possible to get enough protein on a plant-based diet? And I think that everybody here who, when they first went plant-based, they had somebody ask them the question, you know, say it with me, where do you get your protein, right? So we know where we get the protein from. This is a plant-based audience, but how much protein do we actually need? You said that the average person now is getting four times what, what's recommended? That's about right. Um, so, um, well, first of all, when I when, when people ask me that question, I just ask them, "Well, did you turn on? You know, when you went, last time you turned on National Geographic and saw a special on mountain gorillas or elephants, was the first thing you worried about was where they were getting their protein? Right? <laughs> Probably not, right? So I get my protein the same place they do. Um, so, um, unlike you know, when we when we consume excess carbohydrate, uh, we can store that. We store that as glycogen in our um, uh, in our muscle liver, again, that's for fuel. Um, anything that's left over, it gets sent back to the liver to be converted to triglyceride, where it can be stored as fat. Uh, the fat, we can we convert to triglyceride, stored as fat. But protein, we can't store extra protein. Mm -hmm. So any once we've kind of repaired our tissue and kind of day-to-day -day maintenance, we, uh, uh, we, we convert the protein to nitrogen, and it's excreted in our urine. And so we can measure that. And so the point where you... And so there's a lot of studies that the RDA uh, recommend daily, daily allowance for protein for the average person is about 0 0.8, 0 0.9 grams per kilogram. Okay. Um, athletes do need more protein. Um, an endurance athlete, the range is about 1 to about 1.5. The strength athlete's about 1.6, 1.5, 1.6, maybe up to 2. Okay. So as I said earlier, the, the, the natural macronutrient ratios of a plant-based diet are 75% unprocessed carbs, 15% protein, 10% fat. So there's four calories per gram of protein mm -hmm. and four calories per gram of carb and nine per fat. Um, but if you, so if you do the math backwards, so say you, you know, your average kind of activity level and you're eating maybe 1,800, 2,000 calories a day, and you weigh kind of average size, 75, 80 kilos. Um, if you do that math backwards, okay, 15% protein in a 2,000 calorie diet for someone who weighs 80 you know, kilos is 0 0.9 grams per kilogram. Okay. okay, right where you need to be, right? So I just finished an Ironman a few months ago, a couple months ago, and I can guarantee you I wasn't eating 4,000 calories a day. I mean, 2,000 calories a day. Right. I was probably eating 4,000 calories a day because I was working out three hours a day on the weekdays and you know, five, six, seven hours on the weekends. So what happens when I move my caloric intake from 2,000 to 4,000? Well, my protein intake is doubled. So now it's 1.6. Well, what does an endurance athlete need? 1.6 grams per kilogram. So 
it's calories are the key. It's it, you know it's not protein, it's not carbs, it's calories, and that's again that's the beauty. If you eat a whole food plant based diet, you are going to get the optimum ratio of calories. And if you eat enough calories to match your your caloric output, then you'll be fine. And you know, I have a slide I give in my talks that you know I I stop just to be sure I stopped by the protein deficiency ward at the hospital on the way here, and it was empty. Um, so, uh, but I think that that. We obsess about protein. It's it's you know you can get water now that's infused with protein. Believe it or not, you can get protein really? water. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's really insane. Uh, okay, so in all honesty, you are not the first physician to tell me that protein deficiency is is nearly non-existent. In your entire time practicing, have you ever come across a patient who was protein deficient? Uh, no. Well, I mean, so I've seen a couple of patients that were elderly and dying of cancer and, you know, completely malnourished, but no one's ever walked in the office, a healthy, you know, someone there, no one has ever walked in the office and been diagnosed with protein deficiency. These are people that are terminally ill and, you know, malnourished. No one has ever come in <laughs> and been protein deficient. Right. Yes. Let, me, let me throw you a curveball then, because I think that if, if you talk to sports nutritionists who haven't actually gone to school to be a nutritionist and get all of their information from a magazine, they will tell you that you need to eat meat in order to get complete proteins. Not the case? No, completely not the case. So, so proteins are made up of amino acids, okay? And, um, and, and, and some amino acids our bodies can make, and I think there's 12, 13 we can't make. Those are called essential amino acids. Okay. So we have to get those from our food. And um, some proteins are made up of, you know, people talk about complete proteins. So these are proteins that have all these essential amino acids um, and such. But it turns out that you know, we don't absorb protein in our bodies. Right? We absorb amino acids. So we eat the protein. The protein's actually broken down into the component amino acids. That's what we absorb. And then we reassemble them in our bodies to make the proteins that we need. And, and it also turns out that every, any food, almost every food has, com has the complete complement of amino acids. Um, it is impossible to become deficient in an individual amino acid if you're eating a well-balanced whole food plant-based diet. It's just not physiologically possible. We talked a little bit about antioxidants earlier today, but I know that, that when you go out and you give talks on the road, that's another thing that you kind of focus on. So again, just to kind of rehash there, what role do they play as far as athlete recovery? Sure. So um, as I said earlier, the um, oxidative stress is felt to damage the, the, the cell walls actually of the muscles and ligaments, and that's what causes the stiffness and, and tenderness uh, afterwards, the, um, um, especially the muscle soreness. Mm -hmm. okay? Um, and we can mitigate that. We have an inherent ability to mitigate some oxidative stress, but not very much, right? So the rest of that has to come from dietary antioxidants. And so, in general, the more color a food has, the more highly antioxidant it is. And, but what's interesting is that, so we don't think of color, oftentimes when I ask people what's, you know, what, what, do you, what would you think about? Well, blueberries and raspberries and strawberries, and, and all true. But probably the most, some of the most potent dietary antioxidants are actually legumes. Uh, really? Now, like red kidney beans and pinto beans and black beans. The, 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 the pigments that make those dark are some of the most powerful antioxidants out there, actually. Wow. Also, um, spices, um, things like turmeric, ginger, um, oregano, um, uh, uh, cinnamon, all highly antioxidant. And then there's a few other specific foods. Tart cherry juice has a lot of, you know, it's dark red. But it has some um, uh, very highly antioxidants. Actually, there's some clinical research to show that it um, uh, may help specifically um, prevent delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, you know, we know beets, highly antioxidant, but beets have a, another function. They, they increase blood flow. Um, it's kind of nature's Viagra. <laughs> they, uh, it, 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 it it activates nitric oxide that actually dilates blood vessels. Wow. And in endurance athletes, there's some research that suggests you can get about a 10% increase in endurance performance. And, uh, you know, for some track athletes where, you know, literally it comes down to a thousandth of a second 
um, you know, that little bit of advantage uh, can be huge. Yeah, that's that edge that Chris Paul was talking that's about. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I, you know, I was using, I was beat loading um, for my lawn. So I went on, a, uh, ran 15 miles yesterday. I'm training for the Philadelphia Marathon right now. And, you know, I do a, a beet shot the night before. I just take some roasted beets and put them in a blender with a little bit of uh, lime juice. And uh, I took one in the morning and I drink some the next morning, uh, the night before and some the next morning. And um, so, um, and again, it, the, it's just food, right? That's yeah. all. It's just food. Beat shots with the wheatgrass chaser. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That'll keep you out of the bar. <laughs> That's pretty cool, man. Um, let's, let's go back. We, we talked about ancestors a while ago and just how different our diet was thousands and thousands of years ago. But you said, really, it's only been in the last 50, 60, 70 years that really things have taken a, a dramatic change. But before then, before that started, this whole concept of vegetarian diets being beneficial for athletes, that was pretty well known. It's just somehow over time, it's, it's been forgotten, right? Well, it, that is true. Um, there's been a long history of vegetarian athletes dating back to ancient Greece. Um, you know, in the movie they talk about the Roman gladiators mm -hmm. being vegetarian. But if you really think about uh, foodways around the world, right? like my, my mother's uh, family came from Greece, um, meat was a condiment, it was a flavoring, right? They were almost all plant-based, plant at least plant-focused, plant-strong. You might, you know, they might kill a lamb around you know, Easter and in, the, in, in Greece, but but most of the food was plant based, right? You might put a my grandmother, you might put a chicken bone in the soup to give it a little flavor, but but it, again, it wasn't until really post war in the United States where uh, meat has really become we've we've developed this meat centric diet. Um, I had the opportunity last summer to do a three week med school speaking tour in India. Um, India has a huge skyrocketing uh, epidemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes. Tragically, they have, you know, they're suffering both ends of the malnutrition scale in many parts of India, from undernourishment and overnourishment. And um, you, know, you, go to, you go to India and you look at a traditional Indian diet, very healthy, plant strong. You know, and, but nowadays, there's a McDonald's and a, and a, and a Pizza Hut on, on every, a KFC on every corner. And, and when we looked at the changes in Indian food waste, it wasn't sugar, right? It was meat, 100% increase in meat consumption and an 80% increase in edible oils, primarily palm oil in the last 15, 20 years, which corresponds with this epidemic. So it's the fat in the diet, which is, is driving that. And it's mainly coming from, from, from meat. So, so again, historic, and I, you know, I led that, Talk those talks off at the med school, saying, you know, but I could give this talk in, in one two sentences. Yeah, we need to we need to start eating like you did historically, and you all need to stop eating like us. And <laughs> but, but it's true. Um, and so, you know, again, I, I think as we move to this meat centric diet, um, I think that's really what's driving the epidemic of many of these chronic diseases because of the inflammation that's associated with it. Did you see some light bulbs go off in the room when you were giving these talks? I did because they're, you know, they have an allopathic westernized medical system like, just like the one I was trained in, mm -hmm. you know, British space. We've been learning about nutrition. Again, what I learned about in nutrition class, I had like maybe two lectures on nutrition. It was glorified biochemistry in med school. Right. And so I learned what about protein deficiency. I learned about Cauchy-Quartz disease, and I learned about you know scurvy, which is another disease I've never seen. Vitamin <laughs> C deficiency. So it was really the bio. You know, I learned what proteins were in carbs. Were. It wasn't about food, right? Right. It really wasn't about nutrition. It was more kind of pathophysiology of nutrient deficiency that were isolated from food. Here's the cool thing. I think that it's it's not just abroad that people you will you will start to see the light bulbs go off with and it's not just the people in this room going back to athletes they're all searching for that edge if you can sit down with any professional athlete the majority of them and have an intelligent conversation like you and i are having right now they will be very very receptive to this and i think that that's why you're starting to see an increasing number of athletes turn to the plant-based diet i want to ask you a, a couple of questions about a conversation, one, that I had with a player. 
who was, he went on a plant-based diet a few years ago, specifically because he was worried about longevity in his career, but also diabetes ran rampant in his family. He's an offensive lineman in the NFL. But after a few months, he goes to training camp, and I, I go up to him in his locker. I'm like, hey, man, how's, how's the plant-based diet going? He's like, I had to stop that. I just couldn't keep the weight on. I'm not getting enough calories. How You said that when you were training, you were getting 4,000 calories a day. So what is the optimal way for an athlete to helpfully make sure that they're getting the caloric needs that they need? You, you have to eat a lot. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if you're an offensive lineman, you wouldn't think that that's so difficult, right? But No, I mean, uh, um, so in those situations, um, you know, what I was doing was um, I, I did a fair number of uh, smoothies mm -hmm. um, as, and, and I, um, where I would use, um, um, you know, almond milk and fruits and vegetables. So I could really cram a ton of calories into a healthful drink. Right. Um, you know, snacked all the time, lots of fruit. Um, th this is a situation where increasing a little bit some of the more calorie dense foods like nuts and things like that. You have to be a little bit careful, but um, there's ways to do it. Um, but you have, you do, it is a little worried. And I think one of the misconceptions is, oh, plant-based diet, you're just eating salad all the time, right? And that's a, it's a huge misconception. And, but that's not, you, you saw the food here tonight, right? Yeah, okay. A bowl of, I can smell that. It's a curry, I presume. It smells really good. And I can't wait to get a bowl in a minute. When are there leftovers? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, um, so I think there's a lot of misconceptions about plant-based diets, and, 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 and honestly, uh, you know, after I went plant-based, my food horizons just exploded. I mean, I, I love to cook, and the flavors I am able to explore now, the foods, uh, the way I can marry things together, it's really astounding. So I, I think that that's part of the problem, too, is that, you know, we... we Think of plant-based diets. Oh, you're just eating salad all the time, which is, is far from. You know, I'll have a salad every now and then, but that's not what fuels my exercise. Well, I know I've seen your Instagram, man. <laughs> this guy can cook. I don't know if you follow him. I think you're JF Lewis on Instagram. Yeah. It, it is incredible what you're able to do in the kitchen. You are you are okay. a whiz, my friend. Um, let's talk about Cam Newton, very famous Pro Bowl quarterback for the Carolina Panthers has had a number of injuries in recent seasons. Subsequently, we've seen his performance go down. Not as many touchdowns, a few more interceptions, blah, blah, blah. Out comes a opinion piece in the Charlotte Observer, not even an opinion piece, because they went and they interviewed a number of sports nutritionists. And the headline essentially said that Cam Newton's deteriorating performance may be attributed to his plant-based diet. I want to read you a quote that one sports nutritionist gave. And he reads, go back to 2015 Cam, badass Cam. He was a pescatarian, salmon, shrimp. You get a lot of good fats and complete protein. In fact, fish is one of the best sources that there is. Now, you take away the most valuable part of that diet, and there's just no way around it. He can't recover as well with less nutrients, with less calories, and with less muscle mass. It's just not going to happen. And he goes on to speculate that the problem really is A, he's not getting enough calories, but B, he could be deficient in B6 and B6. Statement. I second. Um, so, so um, you know, the, the thing is, if you think about uh, chicken or fish or beef, right? Those animals are really the middle, have become the middleman of for our nutrition, right? Because, yes, there are omega, healthy omega-3s in tan, right? And there's protein, which we need, right? But where did the omega-3s come from, right? They, up the food chain, they came from plants, from marine phytoplankton and algae, right? Yes, sir. And, and when, um, when we have a choice, when we... When we think about nutrient density, okay, I, I like to think of it through the lens of, uh, like we think about money, right? Okay. So we have extra money, we want to invest it in our financial future. And we're looking for a positive ROI. So you're an athlete, and you have a calorie to invest. You want to invest it in your future performance ROI, right? And you can invest 100 calories in broccoli or 100 calories in salmon, right? 
So what do you get back for that 100 calories from salmon? How much fiber? How many cancer-fighting phytonutrients, antioxidants to help mitigate some of that muscle soreness? And there's none, right? All you're getting is protein and some healthy fats. Broccoli has omega-3s. And, and it's also got can compounds that have been shown to help prevent cancer and on and on and on. So you're going to get a much higher performance ROI by investing your calories in foods that are nutrient dense as opposed to calorically dense. And this idea, you know, you get back, you know, the thing about milk and, and can, where are you going to get your calcium if you don't drink milk? But where did the calcium and the milk come from? It came from the grass. It actually came from the dirt that the grass grew in. Yep. And the cow has just served as the middleman, right? Yep. And, 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 and they, all the fiber and all the other good stuff that was in the grass is gone, right? The cows already used it. So, and again, I think it just gets back to this, you know, I, I don't want to say, I don't think it's purposeful ignorance. I think it's just that's the paradigm we operate in in the sports world. Uh, for a long time, the pervasiveness of the bro science, um, you know, the what even the RDs, the registered dietitians, are taught. They're they're very much schooled in this nutritional reductionism, um, uh, which which is in the same way I was taught to think. And so I think once you become enlightened, and you know, when patients were, I mean, all you got to do is just have them keep a food diet for a day or two, and then you can see. And, and I've never seen a patient who was worried about protein, whether athlete or not, who kept an honest food diet for 24 hours, come in and say, see, I told you, I'm not getting that protein, because it just doesn't happen. You know, and uh, as we wrap up here, my, my final point that I want to make before I give you the closing thought here is that you mentioned Derek Morgan, played for the Tennessee Titans, that team featured in the Game Changers documentary. So that season that he goes plant-based, and he sees his stats, his performance on the field just really shoot through the roof. And then he sees a number of his teammates follow suit. Well, the Titans hadn't made the playoffs since, what, the Music City Miracle, maybe two decades earlier? Something well, like so the last time they went to the Super Bowl was when we beat them in 2000, 99-2000, which is where, why I have a Super Bowl ring. This guy, <laughs> this guy, when we beat him. Uh, <laughs> My team that I was peripherally involved in. Keeping healthy, how about? <laughs> uh, but anyway, the time coincidence, sir? I think not. Yeah, no, I, I mean, you know, again, I think that um, it just goes to show you the power of plants. We've had ourselves a good 45 minute conversation here. Is there anything else that you think that we should touch on before we take this one home? No, I don't think so. I, you know, I, I, if you haven't seen Game Changers, watch it. It's it's really a phenomenal film, and you know, we we've gotten we got some pushback. There was an editorial or piece written in Men's Health that kind of you know, made some comments, and I actually wrote a scientific rebuttal to that, which got published in, in Medium. Um, and but but you know, the movie really only says three things. Really, it, it says that you don't have to eat meat and animal products to get big and be strong and run fast and run far. And if you don't eat meat, you'll be healthier and your loved ones will be healthier and the world will be a better place yeah. environmentally. And then that's, that was the message that we, that the producers um, and the director really wanted to convey. And I think they did a really a brilliant job in, in, in conveying that. Um, and so, you know, again, is a piece of salmon or anything gonna kill you? Of course it's not. Is there something in salmon you need, you can't get from plants? No. Are you exposing yourself to environmental toxins like mercury? Yes. If you're eating farm salmon, it's way beyond, it's like a toxic brew. Um, is eating salmon good for the environment? Definitely not. And so I think that, you know, I think the take home message is, is that, you know, plant forward, a plant strong diet, again, it, it, there's no one diet to not get diabetes, and there's no one diet to perform optimally, no one diet to save the planet, and no one diet if you're, if you're compassionate about other living creatures. It's all the same. And and I, it's, it's just such a simple uh, concept that, that I wish I would have learned a long time ago, actually. And my, my final, final thought here is, can I tell them how old you are? Is this okay? Oh, sure, yeah. So this year, my friend here, Dr. Loomis, does his very first Ironman triathlon. And if you don't know what that is, it is basically the single most grueling event known to man. I don't know who thought this up, but they are truly a glut for punishment. You turned 60 this year. That's right. And you just nailed this thing. 
So that was yeah, two weeks after my 60s birthday. I wanted to do something epic for my 60s birthday, and I, so that was pretty epic. But the other thing I wanted to show people was is that when we really, truly take care of ourselves, when we replicate that kind of lifestyle we're designed to lead, we, we, you know, we're physically active, we control our stress, we, we, we recover from our stress through sleep, we eat what we're supposed to eat, we don't eat what we're not supposed to eat, that we have the ability to decouple our chronologic age from our biologic age, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm always going to be, I'm going to be 61 next year, but I can guarantee you I'm much younger this year than I was last year. And so when people ask me how old I am, I tell them I'm 30 with 30 years experience. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, but honestly, that's how I feel. I mean, it really and truly is how I feel. And, and um, there are not enough pills in the pharmacy to take me from where I was seven or eight years ago when I needed to be on cholesterol medicine. I couldn't walk around the block without being out of breath, and I had to use an inhaler if I wanted to go jog to where I am now. And, it, 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 and it's the power of the plants. I'm convinced it probably drives 75 percent of that of that healthfulness, if you will. And, and we, we talked about the DJ Swearinger late in the year and how all of his teammates were shuffling around. But the morning after the event for you, there are people in the lobby who are half your age, maybe even less. They're walking around like zombies, and you are. I climbed White Face Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Amazing. Dr. Jim Loomis, you are just a wealth of information. Thank you thank so you. very much for taking the time. And thank you, everybody out here at Green Fair, Wick Whitaker, Veracles, the entire staff. You guys are just tremendous. Give yourself a round of applause, please. <laughs> and this is the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee. If you have not already done so, please plug, plug, pull out your iPhones, your cell phones, fire up wherever it is you get your favorite shows from. Subscribe to the show right now and leave a five-star message. And, and here's why I ask that. It's not for selfish reasons. It's because when you do that, it improves our rankings on Apple Podcasts. And when our rankings go up, the more high-profile our, our artwork is, and more people will click on that, and then more people will get this game-changing, and in a lot of cases, life-saving information. So Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever it is that you get your favorite shows from, go ahead and subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Leave that high rating, and we would greatly appreciate it, and you'll be doing your part to help change and save a life. Thank you very much for coming out. proclaiming 100% certainty, this is absolutely without question, the best movie ever made. Wow. It, is you, better, it is better than Star Wars, it is better than The Godfather, <laughs> it, it is better than anything you've ever seen. The reason for that is because it takes something that is so hard to grasp, all the science, and it makes it understandable for non-scientific people like me. And all the testimonials and so forth are just absolutely dead solid perfect. Dr. Loomis is a huge part of that, huge part. And so the, the ripple effect that you are creating throughout the world will never actually be measured. We are all grateful for it. Oh, thank you. Does that mean I'm getting an action figure for this thing? A whole line of marketing. So I also just wanted to mention to you, I'm actually a, a sports historian. And just for fun, I download like 12,000 articles from newspaper archives and read them. And Actually, there is a uh, distance runner that none of you ever heard of because sadly his life ended in a car accident when he was very young. He would have probably become the most famous athlete on the planet if he had lived. His name was Steve Prefontaine. Yeah, he's amazing. He's amazing. So, so there's one line in an article about him, total throwaway line I found fascinating. It said he would often buy meat for his housemates but would rarely eat it himself. Now, of course, nobody back then thought the prior program said, what, what, what do you, aren't, don't you eat meat? What's the matter with you? If Steve Prefontaine, perhaps the most legendary American runner in history, an iconic godlike figure, was already on to something back then. And if he had lived longer, he, I would think he probably would have kept on that path and found his performance to, to, 
to skyrocket past everybody. And I think there's a lot of stories like that that have just never been told. No, I think you're right. I, mean, people were, I think people were, um, they, they were, uh, I don't want to say embarrassed, but, but they, you know, people, they, they had, to, you know, it's hard enough to train every day, day in and out, but, but having to defend your food choices to people, you know, you, you just don't have the mental the energy to do that. And so I think a lot of it was almost kept in the closet, if you will. And that was what was so astounding about Chris Paul's statement. That, that it wasn't it wasn't that he didn't want to tell anybody because he was concerned they'd make fun of him. It was because of uh, it was he had discovered the secret bullet, the you know magic bullet, the secret weapon, if you will. And they also don't want to lose their endorsements. Yeah, right. Like, sure. 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 Yeah, Dotsy talks about that in the movie with um, um, some, and then um, and by the way, Dotsy Bowles, uh, who's the, the Olympic cyclist, has a great organization called Switch for Good. And it's a not-for-profit that's uh, trying to help athletes go dairy-free. And, and so she has some um, very interesting things about it. One reason she founded that organization was because to combat, to, to counteract Milk's uh, sponsorship of the U.S. Olympic team. Just one word, so a, a physiological question. One topic I've been trying to follow, I'm not seeing very much information on it, though. It is literally can be the smoking gun that ends the meat industry forever. And that's to do with cortisol. So I've seen articles saying that doctors are now limiting the amount of cortisone injections that they get. I've also seen speculation that cortisol, which is basically sort of like the fight or flight thing that's manufactured, it's very prevalent in animals who are being humiliated, tortured, and killed right before they are done so. And that, that cortisol then can find its way into the meat that we ingest, and cortisol can cause cells to drive way out of control, and there you have cancer. So, yeah, that's interesting. So. Um, as I said earlier, the, um, if you think about um, our stress response, um, we have adrenaline to get us ready to perform act physical activity, and we have cortisol to help us recover. That's one reason we give cortisol shots. But, but cortisol does a couple of other things. It actually will raise our blood sugar in the short term because it's trying to help you turbocharge the engine to fight the leper. But more importantly, it stimulates our appetite in the post-stress period to help us refill the gas tank before we see the next leper. The problem is we are running and fighting emotionally in a modern society, not physically. And we're worrying about a lot more stuff than starving death by leopards. We're worried about jobs and money and relationships and family and politics and traffic and weather and on and on. And then we compound that we don't adequately rest and recover from the stress that we have. We drink too much caffeine, we drink too much alcohol, we don't get enough sleep, sleep's not restful. So what happens when we overstress and under exercise? Because you're held to do right? So, so when we overstress and under, that quarter, that adrenaline that we're making turns against us, right? Blood pressure goes up, we get anxious, our heart palpitates, we lay in bed at night, we can't sleep, mind's racing around. But what about the cortisol? Well, blood sugar goes up, but more importantly, least is stress eating. And when we, so we, we you know, stress eating is a normal physiologic response, but now the problem is we didn't empty the gas tank before we're trying to, our brains are trying to help us fill it back up through cortisol. And so it leads to difficulty losing weight, or you know, on and on. So, so health through stress management, sleep, and our and our and our nutritional. And again, it's you know, again, if you think about our ancestral lifestyle, stress, starving, seeing a leopard, activity, survival, rest and recovery. Doing that repetitively, that's how we build resilience, right? That it's the stress it's called it's it's the stress response um, um, uh, model stress adaptation model. So we stress our bodies, we perform physical activity, then recover. And each time we do that, we can perform a little bit more. Well, guess what? That's a marathon training plan, right? That that's a weightlifting program. So so it's um, um, again it's the maladaptation. I mean, just as an aside, I think one of the problems we have with even our healthcare today. You know, we have, this is a new word I made up, uh, we have diseasified um, many chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Those are not diseases. Those are normal physiologic responses to abnormal behaviors. But when we treat them, when we diseasify them, and now we, we move to a treatment mode, we feel like we can control them, right? We're gonna put you on enough medicine to get your blood pressure down, and then we stop because we've treated your disease. But it's not a disease. Yes, you didn't catch it, you caused it. Right, exactly. And so so it's a fundamentally important concept for people to understand um, that, you know, that, that um, um, 
Anyway, so I can talk about this all day. So. <laughs> Um, yes, um, so that's a, um, so it, it, there is increasing evidence that depression, for example, is a low-grade inflammatory disease, okay, so, so we know that high diets, high in omega-3s and such may help improve mood. We also know that exercise plays a fundamentally important role. Study after study after study has shown that for anxiety and depression, the strongest drug you can take is not Prozac and it's not Valium, it's exercise. Um, the other interesting thing about mental health that we're just starting to unravel is the role that our gut bacteria play in our mental health. That most of the serotonin that we make, which influences our mood, actually isn't made in our brain directly, it's made from gut bacteria. We know that people who follow a plant-based diet have different gut bacteria than people who follow a, a, a more of a Western diet. And that um, it may be that even some of the cravings we have for food uh, may be driven by gut bacteria. That's just now starting to be kind of fully understood. But again, the, the beauty of it is the answer is the same, right? Because you go on a plant-based diet and then your gut bacteria gets better. And, and I can tell you that um, in the middle of my, I started training for this, Iron Man was July 20th, I started training uh, last October. But after the first of the year, when I was in the really hard part, um, we had some unexpected, we had two nurse practitioners go out on maternity leave um, at the practice, and we had one of the other physicians relocated um, to South Dakota. So for a period of time, in my peak training, I was the only doctor or our medical managing 5,000 patients. So I'm, I'm working literally 12, 14 hour days seeing patients, and then training on top of that. So you would think that I would wanna go jump off a bridge, you know? Um, but I tell you, you became, I became incredibly resilient because um, I, I, it was a comment, because I, my diet really, I mean, I eat a pretty clean diet, but during the training, I really cleaned my diet up. I mean, no oil, I mean, it was all fresh stuff and tons of fruits and vegetables and, and on. And um, you, I was bulletproof. And um, I think it was a combination of the diet plus the exercise. Um, that I wasn't stressed, it was amazing, really. Can I add to that? So not from an athletic standpoint, but, but I, this is something that I want to talk about so badly on the show, I just haven't had the opportunity yet. I went on, I was very overweight as a child, uh, fast food baby basically, and I was put on antidepressants when I was, I believe in the sixth grade, and I was on them well into my 20s, and very depressed, would miss, I mean, months of school at a time, could barely get out of the house. And I can tell you that no matter what pill I was given, until I adopted the plant-based diet, I experienced like little to no benefit from that. It would help, it would get me to a certain point, but since I adopted my diet and my gut bacteria changed, my outlook on everything changed, I feel so much better. I used to dread this time of year because of seasonal affective disorder, right? Now it's like October, man. Bring it on, you know. We got the holidays coming up. I'm pumped up, you know. It's it's incredible. So I, I do think that there's a lot of validity into that. I thank you, everyone. Thank you for hosting, Glenn, and thank you for coming here. Um, so my question for you, Dr. Venus, is that um, I've always been thought of myself as a carnivore. You know, I, I need that protein. My whole family is full of protein. I find myself, you know, meeting when, and now I'm doing the 21 day kickstart. So I always thought I eat well, you know, I'm eating grass fed beef, I'm eating pasture raised chicken, I'm doing so good, but how do you actually transition from a life of where well, you're a meat eater to how do you get from being? That's my question. So um, when I talk to patients about it, I, um, I like to use um, analogies, okay? So I think one thing that makes this so hard, dietary change so hard in general for most people, is a simple fact, again, rooted in our evolutionary biology, 
And that is that eating is a learned behavior. And it's something you learned a really long time ago. So all of your food preferences, trigger start eating, trigger stop eating, stuff you learned a long time ago. And so let's think about walking, right? So if we had to think about walking, I have to contract my quad, flex my hip, bend my knee, you would have walked right past the right berry, and you wouldn't have seen the leopard, and you wouldn't have lasted very long. So our brains evolved the mechanism when we habituate a task very quickly, our subconscious brain takes over. Okay? So driving is another example of the modern world. Um, so take white bread, for example. White bread's not healthy, highly processed. But if the environmental trigger you learn to eat white bread is the waiter puts it on the table at the restaurant, at that moment in time, you don't have to think about eating the bread. You have to think about not eating the bread. And if you're tired of thinking, because you had a busy day at work, you're out with friends and family, what happens to the bread? Eat it, right? There's nothing you can do about it. And in fact, it almost becomes free food. Because patients come in and they say, Doc, I'm doing this plant-based thing. I don't understand. I'm not losing weight. My cholesterol's not going down. My sugars aren't better. What did you have for dinner last night? Well, I went out to had you know, quinoa kale salad. But what's not on the list? The four or five pieces of bread you had slathered in olive oil waiting for the food to get there. And the workplace is the worst for this kind of behavior. You know, how do we celebrate, you know, cupcakes for birthdays and cookies and it's Halloween, so there's candy jars everywhere. And it's this mindless behavior, right? Now, you can change it, but it's hard, right? So I mentioned earlier driving is another example. So if you, you know, we can talk on the phone, listen to the radio, still make our exit for the most part. Um, if you were to move to London tomorrow and you wanted to drive, you'd have to learn how to drive on the other side of the street, right? And it would take three to six months every time you got in that car. You gotta be mindful of what side of the road you're on and what side the pedestrians are coming from and how you do the roundabout. And then one day, you get in the car, and guess what? That's how you drive. So really what this process is, it's about teaching yourself to drive on another side of the street, okay? Now, once you learn how to drive on the other side of the street, if someone said, do you miss driving on, the other, on that other side? You'd say, well, that's a silly question because I don't drive that way anymore, right? And you certainly wouldn't think about driving on the wrong side of the street in moderation, now would you? Because <laughs> you only have a moderate number of head-on collisions and run over a moderate number of pedestrians. Well, every time you eat a bowl of ice cream or a piece of bacon, you are literally running over the endothelial line in your heart, cells in your breast, cells in your colon, cells in your pancreas, you know, on and on and on. Now, driving on the wrong side of the street in a car, the consequences are immediate and fairly potentially catastrophic. Driving on the wrong side of the road nutritionally might take decades before you have that head-on collision. You know, you have a heart attack, get diagnosed with breast cancer, colon cancer. So how do you stay focused long enough to learn how to drive on the other side of the street, right? It's hard. So the analogy I use for that when I talk to patients, it's, it's, it's like pushing a snowball over the top of a mountain. When some people's mountains are really tall and the road is really steep. But if you can get the snowball over the top, you don't have to push anymore. You start to feel better. You, you lose weight. You like the way you look in clothes. You start to get off some of these medicines. Everything just gets better and better and better. But the hard part is getting the snowball to the top. So in my experience, having been through this myself and coached literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people through it, I think there's three fundamental things that have to happen. First thing is you gotta find a reason to push that's important to you. And I think we talk about this the wrong way. We, we oftentimes, as clinicians, come out of a paradigm of fear, right? Quit smoking or you're gonna get lung cancer. Or get your cholesterol down or you're gonna have a heart attack. Or get your blood pressure down or you're gonna have a stroke. Or get your sugars under control or you're gonna cut your toe off or whatever. People already know that stuff. And it, and it doesn't motivate change over the long run oftentimes. Um, so a different way to think about it would be, why would it be important for you not to have those bad things happen? And sometimes I, I just do a simple exercise. You give people five pieces of paper, and you label one breast cancer, and one stroke, and one heart attack, and one toe cut off. And you say, I want you to go home and write down the top five reasons you don't want these things to happen. And guess what comes back? One piece of paper, right? Because it's all the same stuff. I want to run for my kids, my grandkids, my retirement. I want to you know, retire to the Caribbean. I want to play the top 100 golf courses in the world. Whatever it is you want to be doing in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, today is the day to start pushing the snowball to be sure that happens. Second thing is you got to figure out how to lower the slope of the road and the height of the mountain. And that's honestly and systematically thinking about what's going to make this hard for you. Right? I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to shop. I don't know what quinoa is. I travel. I'm on a budget. I don't have a lot of time. 
I mean, on and on. There's answers to all that, and with the internet today, and you know, there, there's there. It's pretty easy actually to find to find tools that you can that can help you overcome those barriers. And then lastly, and probably just as important, it's um, you really need to try to recruit as many people as you can to help you push. Um, you know, change is hard, and, and we know that social networks and community play a vital role in in facilitating change. Um, and you know, whether it be friends or families or coworkers or people in the Twenty One Day Cook Start with you or online, for example, Forks Over Knives has a two hundred seventy five thousand strong moderated Facebook group, so there's no trolling, and people people. Um, you know, celebrate successes, they ask questions, because I guarantee you, whatever it is you're struggling with, you know, I've got to go to a barbecue next week, what, what should I do? There's going to be someone in there that can provide you useful advice um, about how to navigate the situation. So that's a long answer to the question. Um, I personally went all in overnight. I saw forks overnight laying on the couch with a statin prescription in my wallet, literally. And thought, wow. So I came back. I was on the faculty at WashU in St. Louis. So I looked up some of the research that afternoon and that night and went plant based. Some people, you know, ease into it, but um, and it, as long as you get there eventually. Is that, is that helpful? I don't know. That's a long answer to an easy question. But I like to talk. That's good. Hi, Dr. Loomis. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for changing your life. Uh, so at this restaurant, I heard Dr. Joel Furman talk about the importance of intermittent fasting. And he said the science was out that would say, well, 12 hours was good, 15, 16, 17 is better. Yeah. And so how does that work with fueling an arduous workout? So yeah, that's the answer to your question. So the question is about intermittent fasting. So, um, you know, we did evolve to undergo periods of feast and famine. And, and you could imagine that when, you, when you're in a famine stage, and, and you're trying to survive to get that next meal before you starve, that if somehow the, the act of fasting itself could somehow boost your immune system and, and on and on, and that would provide a survival, uh, survival advantage. And so work by Walter Longo, who's written a book called The Longevity Diet, um, actually says that, that, that fat, intermittent fasting may in fact um, increase, uh, uh, regenerate stem cells, increase your immunity, and such as that. We also know that intermittent fasting increases insulin sensitivity. And from an athletic standpoint, uh, for endurance athletes, um, there's a concept which I utilize called, uh, it's, so it's, train, it's uh, train low, race high. So what that means is what I would do oftentimes is get up in the morning and go for a 15, 18 mile run fasted. I drink water fast, I drink lots of water, but no calories. And then, that afternoon, I would fast the rest of the day, and then that afternoon, I'd hop on the bike for about 30 minutes um, and, and, and spin it out, but, uh, but with some glycogen depleted now, right? And then refeed after that, and there's evidence that it does two things. It increases fat, um, the ability to utilize fat for fuel, um, and also um, leads to glycogen supercompensation, right? So, um, because we only have about three hours worth of glycogen. You can, for most people, it's between two and three hours. You can increase a little bit through training. But we only have about enough glycogen stored for about three hours of exercise. We have enough fat stored for about seven or eight, nine days um, continuously. So um, glycogen stores best you can so you can sprint to the finish line. And the way you do that is you teach your body how to burn fat more efficiently. And, and so that's what these strategies are designed. It's not something you would do if you're training for a 5K or a 10K. This is really, uh, really only relevant if you're out doing, you know, century bike rides and marathons and, and be, you know, half Ironman and beyond. Um, but it is interesting. Um, and, and again, it makes sense. That, it, that would make sense to me from an evolutionary standpoint. That if I 